Hello and welcome along to another episode of My Football Story from the Honest Football Podcast. This week, Charlie catches up with Chelmsford City defender Michael Spillane to talk about his brilliant career throughout the game. After joining as a late starter at the Norwich Academy and coming through at a very early age to the first team, Mickey went out on loan to Luton Town where he became a firm favourite with myself and Craig as fans. He was part of the squad that played in the minus 30 season in League 2 and went on that run and won the Johnston Paint Trophy at Wembley. And he talks to us about that very unique year and that incredible experience towards the end of it. After returning to Norwich and breaking into the first team, Mickey was unfortunately affected by injuries and later on moved on to the likes of Brentford, Dagenham and Redbridge under John Still, Cambridge during their promotion season from the National League and then the likes of Sutton United, Lowestoft and Chelmsford where he's had a sustained spell at the club over a five year period. At this point Mickey's also taken his first steps into coaching and he talks to us a little bit about what inspired that. But overall, it's a really honest story. He's so frank about the mental side of the game and, of course, about his international honours at youth level with the Republic of Ireland too. So we can't thank Mickey enough for joining us. If you do enjoy it, please do put a thumbs up on the video. Subscribe down below for regular content and interviews from the Honest Football Podcast. But this is Mickey Spillane's football story and we really hope you enjoy it. And I'm delighted to say that Mickey Spillane joins me now. So, um, Mickey, I appreciate you taking the time to obviously chat to us. I know it's quite busy at the minute, so thank you for, for giving up your time to talk to us. Yeah, that's right, mate. No problem. So, obviously, you had an incredible career, which we're going to talk all about. But what we always do before we sort of uh, talk to anyone about their professional career is actually go back to the very beginning. So, just tell us about your first ever memory of football, whether it be sort of playing or watching or, you know, what was the first ever memory of, of the beautiful game? First ever memory was probably just kind of like the soccer schools and stuff like that we used to go to in half terms. Just going to them every every chance I can and when my mum could take me and all stuff like that because obviously they weren't they're not cheap them soccer schools but um, but yeah that was my first memory. Do you uh, do you remember the first game you went to like in a proper ground and all of that kind of thing? I think like, the first game I went to was West Ham Bolton. Tony Cotty scored there on one nil and there was a lady at the bottom of the road called Winnie um, and she took me to that first game. That's that's what I've always kind of remembered. Obviously, you went on to play professionally, but before we sort of talk about that part, in terms of at school, were you that much better than everyone else? Because, you know, for some players, they were just outstanding from the word go and others, maybe a slower sort of development. What was that like for you when you were at school as a footballer? I think at school, I was always kind of one of the best players and where I lived, I'd always play out in the, out in the block with all the older lads and stuff like that just all day, every day and always held me own. So I think I was, yeah, I was one of the better players in, in my schools and stuff like that and, and our Sunday league team and they would set up games like throughout the year against academies and I think we used to beat we beat Palace, Millwall, we beat them all and then as soon as we kind of would beat them, three or four of our players from each every time we beat them would go there and every time my uncle would just never let me go to any of the academies, I always used to really want to go, obviously I see all the lads there and there was there was a lad in my school or class that played for West Ham and I was always not jealous but I always wanted to kind of make that step and he, he always kind of wouldn't wouldn't let me said I was too young to kind of go to an academy and he didn't want me going down that route too early so yeah I was, I was always kind of up there I'd say in my school yeah what what position did you play back then you know in terms of did you move backwards or what, what happened in that sense I always played centre midfield really and then I kind of moved a little bit centre back went to Barnet when I was or they wanted me to go there and I went there and they asked me where I played when I was young and I played up front, or I said I played up front because that's where everyone wants to play when you're a kid. Yeah. But my uncle was like, what have you done that for? And I was like, <laughs> I just wanted to play there. <laughs> you mentioned about sort of not being going to academies maybe when you were a bit younger, but obviously eventually you did. And, you know, you had sort of ended up at, at, at Norwich. But obviously you mentioned about sort of the area you were in. How did that sort of come about? And, and were there other offers? And, you know, just sort of talk us up to that point of getting to Norwich, if that makes sense. So when I was around 12, I think 12, 13, me, my mum and sister, we moved to Cambridge. Um, and at that time I had an offer from like Arsenal to go to their academy. But because I was moving, I was like, the only question to my mum was, can I still play for my Sunday league team? And then as soon as I kind of moved to Cambridge and I went to school, I think it was the first school game I played, the Norwich scout Colin Watts was there and he basically offered me for a six week trial. And I just remember ringing my uncle, just going, please, can I go? Please, can I go? And he was like, yeah, you, I think you're old enough like to go now, sort of thing. So, yeah, and then I just kind of went there and, and signed after the six weeks. 
Yeah, I've got to say, I'll be honest, Vicky, like we, what we normally do then with a lot of pros, we'll ask about that transition from youth football to sort of senior game. But you sort of went ri- literally from one to the other, more or less, didn't you? You made your debut at such a young age. How hard was it to get up to, because obviously, the, and you know better than me, the differences between youth football and obviously the senior level. What are those differences and how hard is it to get up to speed that quickly, if that makes sense? I think it was even a quicker transition for me because when I went into the academy at 13, I wasn't one of the better players in the team that was kind of looked at to three years later make my debut for the first team. Under 14s, at the end of that year, you kind of get a two-year deal to take you through to under 16s. And I think at that stage, they was they wasn't sure about whether they was going to give me a contract. I was tall, I was big, I was strong, I was quite athletic, but I wasn't technically brilliant. I was just kind of I'd run around and smash everyone really. <laughs> and I used to kind of, I used to get to train every day for or every session from Cambridge. So I'd get back really late at night and they would they would pay for that as well. So whether at that age they were thinking, oh, mm. is it too much of an expense? Even that's not a lot, but still so they kind of took a took a chance on me again for that two year contract, and then after that is where I just kicked on because I was just literally all day every day just practicing and practicing technical work and technical work. And as I've got older, I've kind of gone the opposite way. Not that I don't smash people, but I'm more technical player now, and yeah, I'm for my technique and stuff like that. After that, that's when it kind of just really snowballed and happened quickly, really. And the transition for me wasn't wasn't a massive difference it wasn't kind of like oh these are so good or anything like that it was I was just kind of getting on with it and it, nothing really phased me or it was just kind of the environment you're in you don't really notice massive differences obviously there's players that you you know are, mm. are really good but even then even the first team players now big names like Darren Huckabee and all them sort of players I, pr- I appreciate them more now than I did at that age yeah um, as I got older and played the game I realized how good they was rather than when I was 16 thinking how good they was. Yeah. Do you, if you don't want me asking a slightly personal question, because you were so young, do you think that that fear, you almost had a fearlessness that maybe meant you played better in that sense? I suppose, because I suppose at that age, it's hard to understand, isn't it? Maybe the magnitude of what you've just done by playing for the first team at, at such a young age and that kind of thing, or in terms of nerves and things like that, do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, definitely. I, I think at that age, you, you don't have that. I suppose as you get older, you realise how hard it is to kind of be a pro. Um, whereas I was a pro quite early and just kind of got there and probably didn't have to not work as hard because you do, but you don't realise how hard it is to to do it. And because I didn't, I didn't have that. I probably thought it was a bit easier than it was. I always used to get questioned for my attitude. It wasn't um, didn't have a bad attitude. I just kind of just had a certain amount of arrogance, I suppose. That's what I kind of when I coach now. I, I think you've got to have some sort of arrogance, but there's a, there's definitely a fine line in terms of if you go over that, then you, you it's a steep hill after that. Yeah, no, as, as I say, I think we from the outside we sometimes just see the stuff on the pitch, you know, as fans. I mean, and don't necessarily take into account all that other stuff that you like. You say what you need to to get to where you are, and I think it's it's not just on the pitch stuff as you, you just alluded to. But we'll sort of um, just move on to a bit, obviously, then establishing yourself at Norwich. I think from my memory and the research, uh, you know, in terms of Norwich, it was quite a bit of a transition, wasn't there? Sort of managers, two or three different managers around that sort of time. Is that quite hard to sort of try and establish yourself when, you know, you've got like Nigel Worthington and then, you know, someone else and so on and so forth. Do you know what I'm getting at, like that kind of thing? Yeah, there's always, I mean, most of the time you kind of know where you stand with managers. So as soon as you kind of know where you stand and, and then there's a new manager and you're kind of like, right, I've got to start again. And then that manager might not like you. You might have been three months ago, you might have been on the verge of starting every week and then all of a sudden out on loan. Or... So, yeah, it's definitely, it definitely was a stop-start period. But at the same time, I was really young. I was 16, 17, 18, 19 when we was going through all them managers and I just had no patience. I felt like I should be playing every week. And looking back now, it's, I, I was ridiculously young and I should have just been patient and, and kind of bide my time well yeah you sort of mentioned about that 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 period then i suppose of being a bit not impatient or i suppose it's the sort of the way you described it that then you know you end up out on on load at luton which i live in luton to the two other lads who do the podcast a massive luton fan so you know we'll probably talk a a bit about that if you don't mind but before we talk about that period at luton sort of how did you get to that point and and how much choice did you have over that in terms of going out on loan as a young player because you know you're just sort of told by the club right here's a deal you're going for it or do you know what i mean how does that sort of work 
Well, it, it got to the point where I really, really wanted to go on loan. I just wanted to play regularly in, in front of fans and playing men's football and establishing yourself. So I, I was desperate to go out on loan and play. But obviously at that time as well, there's there's hundreds of other players in the same situation and all these clubs, that, especially in lower leagues, haven't got money to to kind of get you in on loan and have you sitting on the bench and mm. all that side of it. So it, it's not easy to go out on loan unless obviously clubs cover the wages and that side of it but I don't actually know how they've done it but yeah when it come up I was I was more than happy to to go down there for the year and at the time I was I didn't really have a future that that season with Norwich uh, if, if I'd stayed I don't think I would have been involved or or called upon so it was a no-brainer for me. Mm. Well you mentioned about that obviously then going down to Luton in, in that sense and I suppose did you sort of understand or know the trouble? Obviously, they're in, off the pitch, unfortunately, in, in all manner of trouble. Did you sort of know that going into that situation? And was it just completely about getting that opportunity to play, really, and, and all the other stuff off the side of it, if that makes sense? It was about playing, but it was also, I knew the size of the club of Luton. If you're in football, you would know. So I knew that they get bigger tendencies. I knew their fans were passionate. So I knew I'd get the experiences of having that pressure and of playing. And the, the points... I can't remember if I actually did know about the points or, or the situation with it, but I know when we when we went down and obviously agreed to go on loan and stuff like that, there was me and Chris went there and there was Rossi from um, Norwich before. And I think we all signed on the same day. I think there was about 20 players all lined up ready to sign because I had no players. But yeah, it wasn't something that put me off or anything like that because of the size of the club. And, and in all honesty, it was I absolutely loved it. It's a club that... I still look out every Saturday every for their results and want them to do well and I'm delighted how well they're doing now because it just it made me not fall in love with the game but it made me realise how much you want to be successful when you when you're kind of playing for fans winning trophies mm. the day at PT when I walked up them stairs when we won it was it made me really realise what it's like to win things and and the top players what they go through to kind of what they must be feeling on on a regular basis and um, it was just brilliant. Yeah, I've got I've got some questions on that final in a bit, but we'll, we'll get to them in, in, in a sec. Just on that, then, obviously, we mentioned it's, it's hard not to mention about obviously Luton that year, and, I, and in fact, where they are now, I think players like you were part of that journey, you know, at the very beginning of it, obviously, to what happened to them. But in terms of the minus thirty points, and and oh, I think the reason, like you were saying, I think they, the embargo was lifted two days before the season started, hence why there was such a, yeah. an influx of players. But when you're then in there and, you know, you started to bed yourself in, what was the sort of feeling around the camp? Because obviously, you know, a tremendously large points deduction. And, and was there a genuine belief that, you know, you could overturn it and, and stay up, if that makes sense? How, what was the sort of mentality like? It definitely was that we could stay up. I mean, everyone says it's an impos impossible task and, and we was always going to get relegated. But if you look at the team we had, 30 points is not actually that much. I know you need a little bit of luck here and there, but if you look at getting 60, 70 points, I think it was kind of playoff form would, would have kept us up. So on the grand scheme of things, I was we all was disappointed in the end that that we went down. So yeah, I think within within the club and the and the dressing room we, we didn't we knew or we thought we could get out of it. Is there a pressure that comes with that or is that sort of just from the outside? Because I remember at the time obviously there was so much being written about and all of that, or do you, are you able to sort of block that out as a as a player if that makes sense? I think we blocked it out and I think what helped was the fans basically because it, the fans kind of was with us in terms of it was us against everyone else. It was minus 30, everything was kind of against the FA, but the club, the players, and even when we lost games and it was obviously when it started to get to the middle of the season when we were drifting, they wasn't booing, they wasn't, they was just every, always behind us. It was, it was unreal. It was such a, a pivotal time for the club in that sense, but obviously someone who's been there the whole sort of journey was Mick Hartford. So I just want to quickly talk about him really. You know, how what's he like to sort of be around and play under and obviously a legend of the club but in that situation you know he's probably at the figurehead of all of it how 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 was it for you playing under him if that makes sense i i love mix he was brilliant for me and chris he'd give us his apartment to to stay in for the year so me and chris was down there and he was just a brilliant manager everyone used to say but obviously how, how scary he was and all that side of it because of what he was like as a player and and the stories i heard but I never really see that side of him. He was always kind of with us. But yeah, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Yeah. And I still, I've got nothing but good things to say about him. Yeah, and it, obviously it's great to, for him to still be involved in the club and where they are now in that sense. So a bit of bit of vindication for him in that. But we'll talk about that, obviously, that Johnson's Paint Trophy run. Because obviously, given all of the negative stuff, that was such an amazing time for the, the club in terms of that run. Just before we get to the final, what 
what do you think worked? Because you turned over some big teams on the way. Do you know what I mean? So what clicked maybe for that that, you know, couldn't quite recreate necessarily in the league form, if that makes sense? I don't know, to be honest. Just probably typical cup competitions and a bit of luck here and there and the players stepping up at the right times, I suppose. But yeah, it was it was brilliant. Even the even the semis final, but not the because you have an area final. Even the area final when all the fans run on the pitch and stuff like that, it was just amazing. So obviously we'll talk about the final. In terms of that, you know, you mentioned earlier on when you made your debut at sixteen, probably fearless and all that kind of thing. Because you've you've played a bit more now and you're a bit more experienced as a pro, going out at Wembley and you know, fifty odd thousand people there, predominantly Luton fans, admittedly. Did you feel different? Was it a different sort of um, mindset before the game compared to, say, that debut when you were at such a young age? Because you've had that experience since then. I think a little bit. It was more just excitement. It was more just kind of seeing, playing in a stadium like that and just seeing it covered with Luton fans on a nice day where you could just see everyone just absolutely buzzing with the fireworks and, and everything. It was just It was just such a good day and... It was more excitement than nerves. It might there's probably nerves in there in your belly and stuff like that, but it was it was just kind of exciting to get going. And as soon as the first whistle went, kind of you don't really think about anything anyway. We went obviously went one nil down early doors, and we thought, oh no, this could be a long day, but turned it around. You mentioned about obviously once that whistle goes. What one I wanted to ask you is one of the, you're one of the few pros we've spoken to who've played at Wembley in such a, in front of such a big crowd. I know it sounds a bit of a silly question, but can you hear like instructions from the bench because of the noise of the crowd and all that? Is, you know, compared to maybe the ground you're normally playing in, how much different is it in terms of that? Is it is it hard to hear those instructions and stuff? Or yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is it is more difficult. That's why obviously you have players and communication between your between your partners and your units is probably more important. But yeah, it's not it's not clear. You obviously do hear the odd things, but even even when you do hear it, sometimes it's like kind of you don't realise you've heard it until after you go, oh right, yeah, I heard. Yeah. But it's too late. You've already given the ball away. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the actual game, obviously you, you mentioned about going a goal behind, but then going ahead. When when Grant McCann levelled deep down, was there a feeling that this might not not be your day? Like talk us through that sort of moment once that that equaliser went in. In that sense, yeah, it was just kind of it was heartbreaking. Cause, I think I made a sliding tackle mm. on the end of the box and it's kind of just dribbled to him. So I'm all, I'm on the floor and I'm kind of like looking like that on the floor and just see it go top corner. I just remember just putting my head down in the grass going, oh, shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah, so, and then obviously when it goes to extra time, you just kind of, they were on top a little bit and I was hoping for kind of penalties and we'll we'll win on penalties. So yeah, when, when Claude popped up with a winner, it was brilliant. Yeah, probably one of the unlikely heroes you'd have, you'd have thought pre-game, you know, Claude Ganapka going forward and obviously doing what he did. But in terms of that, obviously, it was such a, an amazing sort of uh, an experience, and especially for the club. But just on a personal level, how do you sort of view that year at Luton in, in terms of being, a, a, you know, as part of your career? Was it like a foundation for that thought you went on to do afterwards? Do you know sort of how do you sort of piece that in? A little bit, but more, it was probably one of my most enjoyable, if not the most enjoyable year I had playing football. That I definitely look back at the fondest memories of how much I enjoyed it and and stuff like that. If it should have been kind of my foundation and learning, but it probably ended up maybe a little bit of my pinnacle. It's a bit of mixed emotions in that in that sense. No, of course. Well, it, we'll sort of go back then. Obviously, then you know your loan finishes despite a, probably an amazing night out after that final as well and all that kind of stuff. You know, your loan has to come to an end and you're back at Norwich. Just just sort of talk us through because obviously that season then Norwich are in League One and you were part of the the team that got them promoted, but sort of in, in, mixed with a bit of injuries and that kind of thing. How, how was that year for you? And, and you know, how do you, how do you sort of re- review that, if that makes sense? When I left Luton, and I didn't want to go back to Norwich and kind of not play. So my, my initial thoughts is if, if I'm not part of first team thoughts and playing regularly, then I want to, I want to go and play and continue what I've been doing. But they kind of give me a new contract and, and they showed that they wanted wanted me to be involved and wanted me to play. So I was delighted to go back because that was the club I've been at and want, the club I wanted to make it at. So when I went back there pre-season, I'd done well. And in the first game, I didn't start. We got we got absolutely smashed 7-1 by Colchester, which I'm sure all the fans would remember. And there was season tickets getting ripped up and my, my car window was getting punched as I was coming out. I was like, I didn't even play. <laughs> Go punch his window. <laughs> it was his fault. But yeah, so then obviously Gunny left, which... He gave me the contract, and he was the one that showed faith. He was, he come to the games throughout the year at Luton and stuff like that. So it's always kind of like, well, who's going to come in? And then when Paul Lambert come in, he just started my first game, and then and then I was kind of done. I was doing well, 
played the first, I don't know what it was, eight or nine games or something like that. And then, then I pulled my hamstring, which was quite a serious one. And I always, I remember it because we was, I think it was 4-0 or 4-1 at half time at home against Bristol Rovers. He was in front by a lot and cruising. And I remember at half time just saying to the manager and the physio, like, oh, there's something weird in my hamstring. I don't really know what it is. I'm not really felt this sort of, it's not pain, it's just a little something in there. I just remember Paul Lambert just saying, oh, we need you, we need you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll go back out. <laughs> and then within two or three minutes, I think the ball went over the top and I went to sprint and then it just pulled up. And I think they were just through on goal as well because I just had to stop. But yeah, and then I, I didn't think it was that bad. So a couple of weeks later, I just went back in training and then I'd done it again, which was a serious one. So then I was out for a good four or five months, something like that, which which was tough, really tough mentally. When you're in the physio room every day and watching the lads go out to training, and it is a, it's a struggle. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, I appreciate you being so honest, but I was going to ask you about that sort of mentality. But I think you, you mentioned that, obviously, I suppose, are you in for longer days as well? And, and you know, like you say, I suppose the lads out there playing and you're not, you know, it must be so hard to watch them doing that. Yeah, you most most of the time you're in for longer days. You kind of might be in the same time, but you're normally in for longer and you have your schedule on the wall with the physios and it's a lot of work all day, which which is, is, is fine. But it's more the case of just the, the lads that are all chucking their boots on while you're going in the gym. Mm. And it's just when it, it's all right, maybe for a week or so, but then as soon as it starts in two weeks and three weeks and then three months and stuff like that, it's it's really, really tough. And I don't, I don't think people realise how hard it is when they start saying, oh, he's just picking up his money. And I don't think there'll be a lot of players out there that don't mind being injured. No, no, well, I've got to be honest. I, that, that's why we sort of um, try to do these interviews and, and appreciate people like yourself coming on and talk to us about that. Because I do think that from the outside, fans do sit, in, it's not anyone's fault necessarily, but do no. sit in the stands and just see that from the outside, yeah. you know, or, or what moves certain players make and don't know the context of all of it. So, yeah, like you say, it, it is your job. And I think we forget that as, as fans. But it, in terms of that, obviously, Norwich got um, promoted and, and, you know, being part of that, albeit I know you said about the injury. Where, where were you then in terms of the end of that season? Because I know you ended up at Brentford, but were you hoping to stay at Norwich? And was there sort of scope for that? You know, what happened really? Well, at the end of the season, I kind of, there was about, I don't know, six or seven games left of the season and I started to come back from injury and then I was on the bench a couple of games and then I think it was Cholton away where we had to win to win the league. He started me, so I kind of come back and went straight back in really, which was was brilliant for me um, and then played a few and then didn't play the last game. But yeah, it was I played in the important games and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I was just kind of hoping to stay and just I still had a year left of my contract so it was nothing I wasn't thinking about leaving or anything like that and then it got to pre-season I just had a probably about three or four days before we was meant to go back I just had a phone call just to say um they've accepted a bid from Brentford so I went to see Paul Lambert and he, he was good as gold he just said look you don't have to go I don't want you to go it's up to you but you're not going to be first choice um, and you're going to have to kind of fight for your space and all that side of it which it's just normal, I suppose. But me at that age, I was kind of, oh, I just want to play. I just want to play week in, week out. I went there thinking I want to be playing week in, week out. I don't want to be sitting on the bench and, and fighting for a place, which I should have just done. But yeah, but that's the way it is, yeah. Just on a side note, what's Paul Lambert like? Obviously, he's been in the news this week in terms of, you know, we're not asking you to comment on, you know, the whole Ipswich sort of thing. But as a player playing under him, you know, what's he like? Because he's got a good reputation as a manager and has done fantastic things in the game in that sense. I mean, from, from my experience at Norwich and I think all the lads that, were there, uh, loved him. He's one of, if not the best manager I played for. The amount of respect that you had for him made made us play, made us get promoted. Because without him, I, I don't think we would have. Yeah. So you, you obviously mentioned you're at Brentford, and, and you know maybe probably didn't get as many games as what you would have liked. How how what happened that year with Brentford? You know, you obviously mentioned about wanting to get week in week out. You know, what sort of yeah. what was the story there? Well, I, I kind of did. I went there and I, I played every game really for the first 25, 30 games. I was right back, regular right back. Um, and then we had a couple of kind of maybe bad performances I and mean, I was left out and that was what I just couldn't deal with. As soon as I was left out, I just couldn't deal with, I don't know what it was. I just had no patience. If I was left out one game, I'd be like, what's going on? Why am I not playing? Blah, blah, blah. And I'd, I'd think everyone was kind of thinking I'm rubbish and all, all that side of it. That's when I would probably go off the boil a little bit, Not not in terms of kind of drinking and all that side of it but just not concentrating and and kind of probably not caring a little bit more and, and losing my head a little bit 
like you mentioned earlier, I suppose when it's your job as well, for a bit someone like me, it's just a hobby, you know, sort of playing football and it's as much it's frustrating if I'm not playing, you know, whatever that that's what it is. But I suppose when it's your job, it must be, you know, tremendously difficult to to reason that, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that's the mentality and that that players need to have as well. I I would kind of not, not be playing at, at Brentford, I don't know how old it was, twenty twenty one. And I'd have a couple of games on the bench and my mates would text me, Oh, why are you not playing and stuff like that? And that I would just feel embarrassment. And that was that was kind of the way I would deal with it. And that's what I would kind of not worry about, but it would affect me. So yeah, it was it was it was difficult not playing, but that's what a lot, probably 80% of players deal with fine and, and just kind of try and prove the manager wrong and get back in the team. And I didn't have that in me. I was I was the other way. I'd rebel. Well, then I suppose, like you say, you know, I, I think we can all understand why that sort of thing happens. But that, that led to you going to Dagenham on loan in that sense, you know, eventually being a permanent deal. Was that the intention then because of what had happened before or, you know, how did that work out? Yeah, I think my time at Brentford was up with a new manager. I think it was UA Rosler at the time. I don't think there was any really future for me there while he was there. So to go out on loan and, and play again under under Stilly at, at Dagenham was I just enjoyed it again and I was playing and and yeah, I just loved it. So when it when it comes to signing permanently, it was kind of a no brainer for me to kind of get get back on track and, and play week in, week out. I mean, obviously, John Steele such a, a stalwart of game. And, you know, as I say, Luton fans who are probably watching this because of, of you would obviously know John Steele well in that sense. But just talk me through that, that season, especially the one where, you know, pretty much stayed up on, uh, on the last day with goal difference. What, what are those last few games like? How much pressure is that when you're playing in that sort of environment, if that makes sense? There's pressure, but it's kind of, I don't know. Obviously, there are some games where you do feel a little bit more pressure. But I, I've, I felt kind of every game you would you would need to turn up and have that pressure on anyway. Um, I think every every Monday morning or Sunday morning, you'd kind of be thinking about the game for the Saturday and it building up all the way to the Saturday. And then obviously you play and it's like a little rest or you, your mind is like kind of, it's just chilled out. And then all of a sudden it, you have to go again on the Sunday or to building up to the next game. So it was, there was pressures all the time. Obviously, remember, it was, it was a dogfight staying up. Mm. We'll, we'll sort of fast forward a bit because obviously then because I want to talk to you about Rory McCauley obviously someone we've already interviewed just before we do that obviously you, you played with him at, at Cambridge just one question I want to ask you that he'd asked me to ask you which was to do with Yakubu who played for Everton to ask you about his muscles or, or, or something like that or <laughs> oh, just we was on a night out in London once and I remember I think Yakubu was there and I was just grabbing his muscles just saying saying how strong he is and all that side of it I think I had a few too many but <laughs> but yeah I think it was it was quite funny to be fair yeah that that year in terms of getting promoted out of the National League you know was that a, one of the sort of uh, maybe a more positive years that you've had in you know how do you sort of look at that, that time at Cambridge uh, not really no um, I think I left there probably yeah, well I left there at the end of January on deadline day I'd never played in a National League so for me it was I was still a bit arrogant, I suppose, in terms of I didn't want to be playing that level. And when I went there, it was kind of, they were desperate to sign me uh, and I wasn't fit enough. So I was only, only kind of playing away games and, and then coming on and home games. And the two centre midfielders that were there were doing really well. We were top of the league. So when I went there, it was kind of like, I wasn't a regular starter. I was just kind of in and out, in and out. And for me, I, I couldn't take that. You know, playing in a league that I've never played in, not starting, it was kind of, real dense my pride so I found that tough um, and didn't know how to deal with it so then when it come to January I was like I don't I don't want to stay I want I need to be playing I haven't come here to kind of not play and then obviously they went on to to win the league and FA trophy which which was brilliant because obviously for all the boys there and the manager and I was happy for but you still obviously wanted to be part of it and probably play a bigger part in it when I was mm. there Rory was there and obviously he was my yeah, I'd uh, car share with him because he's he's from up Norwich way, so we'd always share cars, and I was with him every day. So obviously he's a year below me, but he was in the Norwich Academy when we was 13s, 14s, and all that side. So I've known him for that for years. Yeah, no, no, I've got to say he, he's a lovely fellow, and I suppose that year for him um, for injuries as well, and sort of similar to what you were saying, didn't quite work out. You both obviously then moved on. What was your your options at that point? Like you say, on in January when you're in January of that year. Well, it got to kind of deadline day because I, I mean they was they were saying I can't I can't go and, and stuff like that. I wanted to go on loan or go or leave or, or whatever the case would be. I just wanted to play, and they were saying no the whole of January. And it got to deadline day, and they kind of said, "Yeah, all right, you can go." And I was like, "Well, I've got nothing sorted now." And it's deadline day, so I was meant to be going to a Scottish club on loan 
all deadline day we was waiting at training and waiting for it to go through and it fell through so at, at kind of late at night I had to make a decision whether to kind of leave them by mutual respect or just kind of stay and, and see how it goes so in the end my decision was to leave with nothing sorted so I left there and then I, I basically didn't have a didn't have a club for the first time and then I had a few options I mean I was I wanted to go back to Luton because still he was still there. That was my number one. I just I wanted to go back there. I, I was so excited, but that just didn't materialise. He didn't have the budget and other, other stuff, whether whether there was excuses or not, I don't know. But that didn't materialise. And I went to an American club, Minnesota. But then it kind of, there was the keeper at Cambridge text me and he said that he's down at Sutton. He said, do you want to, do you want to come down here? The manager wants you here. In all honesty, I was kind of like, I don't really want to be dropping to that level, mate. And then it was kind of it went a couple of weeks went by and it was kind of like well I might as well go might as well go play there Saturday just for a few few weeks to keep fit and until something comes up and then it just didn't in the end you just carried on playing there. How, how did you find that? And, and you know, if you don't mind me asking a, a slightly personal question, did, not did you expect to walk it when you went down to Sutton, but you know, obviously the level you played at and who you played for and, and what you achieved in the game was it as as, as difficult or, or as easy? You know, how how was it in that sense playing for the Sutton in that league? The standard's still really good, and I think that's still at the windows all the way down. And even in the Conference South, when I'd never heard, not never heard of it, but I haven't heard of a lot of the teams in the league. But there's still some really, really good players. So it wasn't. I didn't find it hard, but I didn't find it easy. I think it was one of them that, throughout my whole career, that I had a lot of coaches would say to me, "Just you play at 60 70 percent all the time." I think that was just the way I am. I think I, my body language is really bad. It always looks like I'm really chilled. And they would say to me about like your body language and stuff like that. And it was something that I couldn't, well, not couldn't, I don't know. I, I would try, but it, I think it's just the way I play. No, no, I appreciate you being so honest about that. And, and you know, I think it's fascinating to hear that side of it. Because as I say, we just sort of see whether so-and-so is in the squad or not. And, it's, you know, it's really important to get that sort of side of the game, you know, discussed as well. If you don't mind me asking a personal question, I'm not after, you know, money or finance or anything like that. But when you sort of then go through like Sutton and Lowestoft and that kind of thing, what are you also doing? Because obviously, you know, if you don't mind me saying, I suppose it's not the professional levels that you were playing at before. So in terms of keeping, you know, mortgages and bills as, as any yeah. sort of person, what else are you doing at that point? I think at Sutton and stuff like that, you don't, the money was still okay, so it wasn't it wasn't a fact that I had to work. It, it got to a stage where I did, just because Sutton only trained three mornings, so it was kind of like the other mornings I was like, I need to try and get in the real world. I think a lot of the players, when I first went there, they're, they're used to it. They're, they're semi-professional. They've got jobs, and that's just their life. I was still a footballer in my eyes, and this was just a kind of stopgap. Probably what the best thing I ever done was my, I went to work for my partner's brother who owns a groundworks company and I went and done some groundworks and it was kind of a real eye opener to this is the real world um, mm. and no, one, no one's going to come and come and say right come play for Norwich tomorrow you're getting you at this groundwork company yeah you, you, you've got to kind of build a new life about what you're going to do and build new targets and stuff like that so it was good for me obviously I didn't like it it's not it's not um, something I like it's not in me but I've done it for a year and I'm glad I did yeah, I think they say maybe that, that has an impact, you realise, I suppose, that has an impact on your football and I suppose appreciating the game. But um, just before we carry on with your, your sort of club career, I wanted to obviously talk about international honours. So, you know, you played all, all the way through the age groups up to under 21 for the Republic of Ireland. How do you rank that amongst the stuff? Obviously playing at Wembley, you know, winning the, the trophy for, you know, playing at Norwich at 16. Where does the sort of international game fit for you in all of that stuff you've achieved in your career? It's definitely up there because... It's, it's something you always have. It's something that you can always say you play for your country, captain your country. I played all the age groups. I played against some amazing players, amazing countries in some amazing places. So it's definitely up, up there in terms of achievements and the amount of appearances I did have just makes it kind of all worthwhile, really. Yeah, and obviously a, a goal against Germany. So I suppose that, you know, no one can ever take that away from you in that sense. But is there a difference between, you know, club football and international football in the sense of on the pitch sort of stuff? Because, you know, I suppose as a fan, we always think, oh, international football is a bit slower, it's a bit more methodical. Is, is that actually true or, or not really in that sense? Yeah, there's definitely the way the country, different countries play in terms of their build up and whether they're mid block, deep block, all that side of it is real clear at international level. They have just kind of, you could play against Northern Ireland and, double header and then you're playing against I don't know Mexico or something like that and it's just completely different the way the teams play 
so yeah you do definitely see the different styles in different countries and, and the way they approach it it's fascinating to hear that because I suppose, as I say, we have like, as a fan, we have an outside view of it. In terms of obviously back to your sort of career before we come to what you're doing now, you obviously had a good period at Chelmsford. Just one thing I want to talk about first before we go on about, you know, your, your sort of time there was that goal of the season, Marco Van Basten-esque, and there is clips of it online for people to watch. Just, I just wanted to really quickly ask you about that goal. When that ball's coming over, do you know you're going to hit it first time or? Yeah, I think so. I think it just kind of, the way it looped up was kind of just set up for me to it. And yeah, I just caught it nice and it went in. Yeah. So in terms of Chelmsford, obviously, you know, particularly, you know, one season, I think you won players, player, managers, player, supporters, player, pretty much the whole, you know, clean sweep of the whole, the whole of sort of award, end of the season awards. But um, yeah. how was that experience for you? And how, how do you sort of look back on that, that time, given, you know, what had happened before? Yeah, it was, it was another time where I was enjoying my football. It was a sustained period at a club, which I didn't really have. I'd always kind of be at a club for a year, year and a half and then leave. So Chelmsford, I started to settle down and, and play for the whole year and then it's two years and stuff like that so it really started to become in me the, the club and it always kind of got to stages after two years where I'd kind of want to leave or, or have a, want a new challenge but it didn't really happen at Chelmsford so yeah I, I've loved it there. On a personal sort of level obviously you can't play the game forever and as much as you'd love to you know what what's the sort of plans now what are you doing now and, and what's the sort of future hold in that sense in terms of the game? So at the minute I'm, st I'm still a player, assistant manager and academy manager so doing everything <laughs> um, it has been more more difficult than I thought in balancing playing and being assistant manager and coaching I thought it'd be a little bit easier obviously last year I'd done it but I was injured so mm. it was a lot easier so this year is just about kind of getting into it because obviously I've, this is my first full-time coaching job in men's football as well I'm still only 31 so it's been a lot of learning during during Covid as well which is not normal circumstances to kind of be doing your learning but I've loved it. Um, I've learned so much. And yeah, I'm just looking forward to kind of next year now next, or next season when, when, when we get going again. Yeah. So, and I think obviously the, the non-league side of it's been hit so far, so hard by this. So, you know, it, it's really important. We obviously do, you know, hopefully that season gets started and we won't have any more of this sort of nonsense that's been going on. But just before we go, we always finish with just some quick fire questions. And I, I'd sort of said to you, we wouldn't ask you all the same questions, but you've probably asked some of these before, but we'll, we'll go for them anyway, because we always do. The first one is your favourite ever ground you've ever played at? Wembley. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I've, to be honest, when I wrote it, I did think you'd probably have that answer, but yeah. I suppose if it's not obviously Wembley, it'd be Etihad, so that was right. that was decent. The next one is a question we've only started asking recently with, with players. Actually, is your favourite pair of boots you've had? You know, in terms of across your career, I had some red and black Umbros when I was at Norwich at about I don't know nineteen twenty, and they they was my favourite boots, but I just can't get them anywhere now. I'll be looking for them everywhere. They were like some sort of special edition ones or something like that. <laughs> One black, one red, but I don't think I'll get away with them now at 31. <laughs> That's a bit, I'm the same age as you, and obviously I'm only sort of grassroots footballers, but yeah, once you get to a certain age, I suppose there's only, there's only certain boots you can get away with. I think you might have alluded to it earlier, but you know, you had various managers across your career. If you if you had to choose a favourite, if it's going to upset people, I don't want you to answer necessarily, but if you could, you know, if you fancied answering. I'd say probably Mick Harford, my favourite. It's one you've probably been asked loads, and I do apologise, but you know, the best player you've played with and the best player you've played against in your career. Best player I played with, probably Wes Houlihan in training and stuff like that. He was just un unbelievable. Best player against Manuel Neuer, I suppose. Right. Bloody yeah, that's not a bad name to drop that, is it? To be fair. Yeah. <laughs> the best player I actually played against, or the best performance where I kind of thought, God, this, this geezer's unbelievable. He's, and he's turned out that he's flopped a little bit, really, to be honest. Um, was Gabriel Obertan. He, right. he went to Man United, but we played against him when he played for France before he went to Man United. And he was just unbelievable, right. unbelievable. And, I, and this was, at, I think, under 19s and they paid six million for him or something like that. And I, th I was remember just thinking he's going to be like unreal. And he, he's obviously flopped a bit since then and yeah. he doesn't look anything like he did that day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just caught him on a good day in that sense. But um... I, I think I might have made him look good, to be fair. I think he might. No, no <laughs> not that. this is a two part question. So it's your favourite ever game you've played in. And then your favourite of a game that you've watched, so you couldn't have been involved in it, whether it be in the stands or on the TV or whatever. So his favourite game I've played in is probably my debut, just because of the mm -hmm. it was my debut was against West Ham, which is the team I support. It was on my dad's birthday as well, which just all the stars aligned. Um, my dad passed away when I was younger, so it was just kind of it was just to match all of them three together. It was just amazing. Favourite match I've watched it'd probably be when I was really young, England Scotland. I think when Gaza scored that. Yeah. That one, that would, that would be up there. I must have been eight. <laughs> I don't know how I remember that. 
I, I'll be honest, they're two cracking games. I remember that game, actually. I spent the rest of the, the evening trying to recreate it in the garden, but, you know, it was, it was such yeah. a special moment. That, that whole tournament was incredible. But, but you yeah. know, you know, that's two great games to finish on. And I've got to be honest, it's been one of my favourite chats. So I really appreciate you, obviously, taking the time to talk to us. So, you know, thanks for everything. I really appreciate that. No worries, mate.